we're here at uh, Ono Station. And I will flip the video around so we can see a bit of the this, this scenario. This is a parking lot in front of the station. Um, here's a, a radiation monitoring post right here showing 0.3 microsieverts per hour. Up there in the window, you can't see it so well is the sensor that Joe just installed, the air note. Um, this is deep inside the exclusion zone. Mm -hmm. And a few years ago, the government decided to establish something called SRRZ, Special Revitalization and Recovery Zones, which means decontaminating a small piece inside of the highly contaminated exclusion zone to enable people to come back. Um, but what they've done is sort of turned this into a, I mean, the station is open. Not many people use it. Um, and there's nothing around here. Uh, this is a pretty well-known ghost town. Uh, and has been covered in lots of media coming to the old Shoten guy. I'm walking forward to show you. So, so there's a train coming once in a while? Every hour or so. Every hour, okay. And uh, there's like a, a little shuttle bus that will come and take people, but nobody's living here. The station is open, uh, but nobody's living here. And it's unclear when people will ever live here. It's really just a ghost town. And uh, I think we're going to talk to Tom Gill. Is Tom Gill uh, connecting up now? Uh, yep. Um, hey, Tom, how are you? I'm okay. Um, but I can't start my video. It says the host has disabled it. Oh, now it says. Okay, it's maybe the host will now, enable now your video. They're now they're there you are, Tom. Okay. So, Oh, By way of introduction, Tom Gill is a sociologist, lived in Japan a long time, uh, studying marginalized people, and spent a lot of time uh, in Fukushima, particularly in the Nagadora area of Itate. And we got to know each other. And Tom, the other day, we had an interesting conversation, uh, which is why I wanted to talk today about this strange thing that happens with Japanese governance. And how did you put it? The difference between places and people. What was your observation about that? Okay. Um, by the way, I'm strictly speaking an, a social anthropologist rather than a sociologist, but never mind. Okay. Uh, um, uh, so uh, my argument is that in, in Japan, we have a very strong um, uh, ideology that um, stresses the importance of the relationship between people and the land. Um, and uh, so uh, you're supposed to love your furusato, you know, furusato, your hometown, your home village. Um, if you say you don't love your hometown, it's a bit like saying you don't love your mother or you don't love Japan. It's the sort of thing that's, you, that's just uh, virtually impossible for most people to say. Uh, and uh, so what is uh, a furusato? Well, it's made up of a place, a certain place in which people live. And most of the time, um, uh, no, nobody even thinks about whether it's the place or the people that matter most because um, uh, they, the, the, the issue doesn't arise. However, the Fukushima nuclear disaster did turn that into an issue um, uh, because uh, places like Itate Village, which, that I've been studying for the last a decade became uh, uninhabitable uh, and um, the question naturally arose of um, uh, what should what should be done with the people and um, at the time there was a movement called the Shin Tenchi or Motomeru Kai the um, society for demanding a new homeland and uh, th they launched the petition demanding that the government find some other piece of land, preferably in Fukushima prefecture, to create a new Itate village so that the community could survive in a different place. And they picked up about 600 signatures on that petition, uh, which um, uh, was uh, uh, only about 10% of the population. Itate village had a pre-disaster population of about 6,000. And that, uh, that option 
was never taken. Uh, and uh, instead, the mayor of Itata um, uh, and many other um, people in positions of authority um, laid this really heavy stress that what Itata village means people living on this particular piece of land. But this particular piece of land was officially too radioactive to live in. So what were they going to do? Well, they've spent a decade uh, and uh, many uh, trillions of yen on decontamination. Uh, and uh, and nine, 19 of the 20 sub-districts of Itase are now open for habitation again, but less than 20% of the population has returned. And um, it's very unlikely that any more people uh, will return because after so many years, uh, they have got used to life in a totally different place. And so, uh, sad to say, um, Itate village has been preserved in the original place, but without nearly all the people due to a misplaced uh, emphasis on place rather than people. That's my basic argument. Well, that's well put. That's extremely well put. And I think we, we do see this uh, happening throughout uh, the, the Fukushima region um, that it, it connects with what we heard from others, Mr. Ishizaki about it's easy for the government to support the building of infrastructure, of buildings, of boxes, uh, but yeah. it's very difficult to support the soft infrastructure, the people, the education. Mm -hmm. And I think you really hit the nail on the head by highlighting this, this perception uh, that, you know, the government is responsible for a piece of ground. It's responsible mm. for a territory, a physical territory, not so much responsible for the people, um, mm. along with the historical reasons mm. for that. But you know, Asby, um, uh, this has been very much the picture with the Fukushima nuclear disaster. But if we think about other examples, for example, what about the um, coastal communities that were devastated by the tsunami in other parts of Tohoku. Quite a lot of those communities have been rebuilt further inland or on the top of cliffs where before they were at the bottom of cliffs. Um, so, you know, it's not impossible to keep the people together while changing the location. And also Japan uh, notoriously has a colossal number of uh, dams. Uh, and when those dams were constructed, lots of villages and communities were flooded and they were paid compensation uh, and um, provided housing in other places. So uh, although this obsession with, with the connection between people and land is so strong, um, there are situations where it is overruled. Uh, why wasn't it overruled uh, in this case? Um, uh, I think a number of reasons. Um, uh, one is uh, local factors, the, the very strong insistence of local leaders on, uh, in, in my case, the mayor of Itata, who was completely obsessed with returning to the land. Um, he published a book uh, in which he, he promised that they'd return in two years. In fact, it ended up being six years. And in, and in the case of one district, um, it looks like it's going to be 13 years. Um, and, um, and also there's a, a certain, um, a certain grayness about exactly how dangerous the radiation is. If your village is, is uh, flooded and it's under 20 meters of water, you know you're never going to live there again. Um, in the case of radiation, you know, there are lots of different opinions about what a safe or dangerous level is. Uh, maybe one day it might be possible to go back. And uh, I think that crept in and influenced the debate. Yes, uh, it's great. And uh, one, we have to understand and admit that this is an unprecedented situation. And there were no contingencies for this sort of for the situation. And as you point out for the uh, other parts of the Tohoku coast, Yes, it was not irradiated. It was theoretically possible for people to return if some infrastructure and repairs were made. Uh, whereas here, it was simply uh, 
not deemed possible. So the other side of this is when I've spoken to um, the government officials, for instance, connected with the town of Okuma and Ono Station is part of the city of Okuma, um, they seemed very sincere mm. about wanting to make it possible for people to return mm. uh, to places like Ono. And yet I don't see the capacity or the vision necessary to, to present any kind of attractive uh, or positive lifestyle in a place like this. Other parts of Fukushima, possibly. Uh, individual communities in many places we know have great vision, they're working very hard, they're doing great things. But I don't see uh, any, any real attempt at persuasion uh, of getting people to, to return. It's more like we had a punch list, uh, things we said we would do, we've done them, we've done our job, now it's up to you. So kind of throwing it back on uh, the, the populace. Um, and if I may, another factor related to that, Asby, is that, well, I agree with you that uh, local governments, uh, government officials, uh, uh, on the whole, they've been sincere. They wanted to do their best for the people. Uh, and I'd even say that uh, with a few reservations of the national government, you know, the, um, the, you know they, they want to do the right thing. But what is the right thing? Um, and um, part of that attempt to, you know, expiate guilt and and show that you really care, it has been compensation policy. And um, you know, uh, a lot of the people uh, who are living in the contaminated contaminated areas have received enough compensation money to make them pretty rich. Yes, uh, rich enough to buy a a new a nice big new house in another part of the prefecture and, and of course uh, once you've done that um the uh the um urge to return to your tumble down farmhouse uh it, 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 you know in a fairly remote part of the country which may or may not have been sufficiently decontaminated but even if it has there's still lots of undecontaminated forests and mountains around it uh, gets weaker still so yes. um giving out the compensation uh and um uh and um taking a very long time over the decontamination put those two things together and um most of these communities um will uh, will die they'll yes. die people they, vote they with their feet died. and they vote with their feet and most have already made their decisions. So yeah, it's a very interesting situation. Um, you know, there's a lot more we can talk about. Um, and um, I guess, you know, if I were a Fukushima resident, which I'm not, and it's hard to, we shouldn't overgeneralize because people have many different opinions, but um, I do know that people love their hometowns, like you pointed out, mm. they love mm. their hometowns. And this has been a wrenching experience. And, mm. and I can think that people would hold on to the dream of being able to return at some point, even if now, mm. They're, they're unwilling to or, or making roots elsewhere. Um, mm. Throws us back to, yeah, what is the responsibility of government in this situation? What is governance? So um, maybe if you have one last comment and then we can wrap this up, I think. Um, okay. Um, well, okay, one last comment. Another reason why um, uh, people have been so reluctant to return even after the giant decontamination programs is because of uh, the fact that they don't trust the government. They're told that, that it's safe to live there, um, but um, you know they've been lied to before. Uh, the government did lie on a number of famous occasions, especially er in the early days after the disaster. And um, uh, this may be a, a little controversial for some of your Safecast followers, but I would say they were also misled by the anti-nuclear lobby, which exaggerated the health risks of radiation. Um, re after 10 years, I think the verdict is in. There is no, not going to be a, a massive uh, increase in cancer, leukemia it, it, among the people of Fukushima. Um, and I blame um, the anti-nuclear lobby for failing to distinguish between 
two totally different things. One is nuclear power a good thing for Japan, where I would agree with them and say, definitely not. And two, is there going to be a, a terrible health crisis in Fukushima? That's a totally different topic. And my, my answer to that is, was 10 years ago, still is, no, they're going to be all right. Um, but uh, they, they're not going to be harmed by radiation, but they have been harmed by stress, discrimination, um, and um, a, a lot of other very um, harmful things that came along with the uh, exaggeration of the health risks from radiation. There, I said okay. my say. Well, you said it, and that's a very clear statement. I do know a lot of people who agree with you. I agree with you most, mostly. I would just say that at the time of the accident, there was so much we didn't know and didn't have the information about, and that lack of trust, as we know, still persists. So, um, well, thanks a lot, Tom, and I look forward to talking more and to hearing more about your work and reading your great uh, writing about it. So, I, Okay, well, thank you very much for having yeah. me on. Thank you. By all means, stick around. Uh, I'm going to sort of flip the camera around here. Um, oops, oops, what do I do? Okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll say bye for now and I'll, I'll turn off the video. Bye. Yeah, bye. Bye. Um, so, yes, I'll flip the camera around. Um, so here we are. Oops, sorry. This is the camera? Where's the camera flip? Yeah. There. So here is the uh, air note that Joe installed here in this absolutely empty, it's not a ghost station, it's like an unborn station here in Ono Station. You wanna go take a point at that, Joe? Um, yeah, and uh, 0 0.6, um, but that, this is a, a, a PM 2.5 it's, it's, it's not air, radiation. Air quality it's meter. And this yep. is an air pollution sensor yeah. measuring a particular yeah. sensor in the air. This yeah. is our, our rollout of those yeah. devices. Yeah. So this is kind of the strange, you know, slightly dystopian reality uh, we have here in a place like Ono. And um, yeah, I don't know. How, how's you guys uh, in Tokyo, Peter and uh, Emmy? Yeah, I'm here. Yeah. Okay. Um, Hello? I think you're on mute, Asdi. There you go. Uh, in the station, they have these very clear maps, you know, with lots of information about radiation levels. Uh, anyone who comes here is going to want to in Japanese and in English. And there's this very, very slickly produced map where you can come in the waiting room where nobody ever waits <laughs> uh, to a map to find out about the radiation, current radiation amounts. Etc., and it'll have the map, and you can sort of zoom in and get the information from various, um, you know, radiation sensors. So, radiation is very, very on the forefront of, you know, the concerns uh, of the government and the railroad company when they uh, uh, rebuilt this station. So, there, yeah. there is no one else besides you guys. Well, we see one or two people. Uh, earlier on, when Joe was, we were getting ready to put in the sensor, we saw some guards. <laughs> so we sort of waited. That's why we walked around for a long time. Uh, but we've seen one or two people coming to take the train. Um, but it's really, there's no staff at the station. It's a totally unmanned station. Uh, very, very beautiful, clean, you know, but it is really uh, a station without a purpose, I think. Uh, just like we see many parks without purposes and that kind of infrastructure work. Uh, without people. <laughs>